Good evening and thank you for joining us. My name is Chrissy and I would like to welcome you to the Doylestown Bookshop's virtual event series. We are thrilled to welcome back Violet Cooper Smith as she discusses the newly released Build Your House Around My Body with author David Mitchell. Violet and David will begin the event with a discussion. After that, they will take questions from you, the viewers. If you would like to submit a question, please click on Ask a Question on your screen and enter your question there. If you're watching from a phone or tablet, click the icon with the question mark to submit your questions. If you would like to purchase a copy of Build Your House Around My Body from the Doylestown or Lahaska Bookshops, click the button on your screen that says Buy the Books. We have convenient curbside pickup at both of our stores and ship worldwide. Now a little bit about our guests. Violet Coopersmith is the author of the short story collection, The Frangipani Hotel. She previously taught the English, the English, okay. <laughs> she previously taught English with the Fulbright program in the Mekong Delta. I do not teach the English. And was a creative writing fellow at the University of East Anglia. She has lived in Daylat and Saigon in Vietnam and currently resides in the United States. David Mitchell is the award-winning and best-selling author of The Thousand Autumns of Jakob de Zut, Black Swan Green, Cloud Atlas, Number Nine Dream, and a number of other wonderful books. Twice shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize, Mitchell was named one of the most 100 influential people in the world by Time magazine in 2007. And his wife is still laughing about it. <laughs> With K.A. Yoshida, Mitchell co-translated a... from the Japanese, the international best-selling memoir, The Reason I Jump, he was in Ireland with his wife and two children. Hello, Violet. Hello, David. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you, Chrissy. Hi, Violet. Hi. Hello. It's so exciting to be here. Same here. Hey, it's just the two of us. Oh. Um, oh. Um, I uh, wrote a little introduction for the book because I didn't know if one was going to be expected or not and uh, as a fellow writer like yourself you'd know that I'm far too miserly to not use that since I spent a few minutes just assembling my thoughts about the book so just as a launch pad do you mind if I uh, read this while pretending not to glance at my notebook just to the <laughs> left of the screen uh, because it's a wonderful novel I really loved it and I just wanted to get a few thoughts assembled and uh, it'll sort of work yeah Thank you. Build Your House Around My Body is a dark, smart, vivid, ghost, mystery, crime, revenge tale. It tightens a knot made by the narrative strands of Winnie, a drifting Vietnam Vietnamese-American misfit in Saigon, and the unrequited love triangle between two brothers, Tan and Lang, and an irascible, kick-ass female protagonist, Bin. It spans decades. It assembles itself from many moving parts. It's a portrait of, Sa of Saigon. Um, this is maybe the head of the body of uh, South Vietnam. It is psychologically acute. It is beautiful, disturbing, ennui drenched and droll, often on the same page. It is always gripping. It is a wonderful novel, and I and uh, I felt privileged to read it, and sort of re just rejuvenated and excited by the possibilities of fiction. Uh, I knew almost well. Um, I, I I knew I I I've read a number of books um, about, um, of course, the history of the war, but um, actually, the book really highlighted for me my. Uh, ignorance about everything else in Vietnam other than the catastrophic Vietnam War. Um, so just thank you. It's a great book. I loved it. Um, I know very little about you, Violet. We haven't met before. So I'm. Um, this is another area of ignorance I hope to at least partly remedy in the next 45 minutes or so. This should lead into my first question. It, doesn't really so i'll just let you get a word in edgeways and then jump uh rather unprofessionally into what is kind of my first question but um um actually it will lead into my first question which is which, which, which isn't one i planned but um uh to what degree did this one write itself to what de 
degree did parts write itself to what degree did uh it it, it it just reads so fluently that it doesn't feel kind of um problematically labored over uh is this you just um kind of was the birth of the book a difficult birth and you just disguised it really well page or did it um once it started to come did it arrive as fluently as it reads over <sighs> It was a, a a harrowing labored birth. Okay. It felt, it was the writing of the book, it felt like trying to to wrestle something, some sort of monster that you couldn't, that kept like shape shifting the whole well, time. <laughs> uh, I'm not surprised to hear you use that metaphor, given what happens in the book. <laughs> uh, I think uh, the 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 process of of writing it informed what went into the book um, eventually and I spent sort of half of the time writing it feeling like I was like one of the one of the the, the ghostbusters one of like the psychic mediums mm. trying to channel this horrible unruly spirit um, but then there were other times when it felt like I was the ghost getting to sort of gleefully hop from from body to body <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with these characters. Yeah. Um, speaking of physical strangenesses, my head is about three times the size of yours. So I'm just going to move my computer a little bit. So there we go. I'm, I'm doing my, my bobbing cobra dance too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my head might grow based on how excited I get doing this. <laughs> um, if I, um, in that we haven't met before, uh, I'd like to ask my first proper question, if I may, uh, aimed at a period of time way before the novel way back when you were as a uh, as a kid first entranced by narrative um and i like to ask this question of all writers that i interview because the answers are never the same uh, and i think they could, and 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 it might be revealing and hopefully fun for you to think about um thinking back to when you were first entranced by narrative could you give me three or four early examples of stories that um that that, that this that 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 hypnotized you and maybe made you want to build narratives as as well they're not necessarily books they may be tv shows or comics or films that also welcome uh obscure is also fine um i find often if it's stuck in your memory since the time when you were a small kid then it's often stuck there for a reason and these reasons can be quite illustrative sometimes so over to you mm. three or four stories narratives that you just loved that you still remember now well I, I i devoured all things wool doll and sort of dark right, <laughs> humorous right. and, yeah. and creepy yeah um but i was also i had this this set of sort of uh retellings of of um Norse mythology that I, right. I it was Norse mythology for me, which was completely removed from my my own ethnic background. But I was yeah. just entranced by by yeah. that particular set of gods and How their come? stories. I don't know. Anyone? I don't remember. Um, I I don't know. I wonder well, if one point was that it was so different to. Um, the gods that you might have been exposed from your own ethnic background perhaps perhaps that's a reason because they didn't have an, uh, yeah I, we don't have ice giants <laughs> in, yeah. in vietnamese yeah. um stories but i loved i loved those and i was very attracted to the illustrations too i think I, yeah this 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 particular book that i had um but then the the next sort of jump well it's embarrassing because reading reading cloud atlas at like 16 sullenly in high school in a study hall instead of doing my math homework it was oh. like one of the <laughs> formative book <laughs> experiences and um discovering haruki murakami's mm. um work so that's that's one of my 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 formative memories of of just a book that i wanted to Put myself into but also to ingest <laughs> to keep it with me forever i must thank you and also point out that you just made me feel extremely old <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh 
I didn't want to do that. Um, um, uh, were, you, um, were you able to watch much TV as a kid? Did any um, kind of hokey Saturday morning TV shows filter in? Or if they did, have they all evaporated by this point? Mm. I watched, my favorite ones were sort of these obscure video recordings that my father's a librarian and right. he would he would sort of get these, What they weren't aired, but I loved, um, there was this one BBC 1980s cartoon version of um, George MacDonald's The Light Princess that okay. I loved and it's, it's weird rewatching it. As an, as an adult, it's, yeah. it's this odd blend of, of um, live action and animation. Um, and now that I think of it, there is a large creepy snake in it, of hey, course, that hey. must, have, must have burrowed into my subconscious uh, to rear its head again <laughs> in my own fiction. Did you, um, did you read any comics or comic books at all? As a, as a young girl, oh, we've lost you, Violet, which probably means you've lost me. Oh, you back? Violet has frozen. Um, I'm okay. Refresh the feed. Give me just a moment. Okay, Violet, if you can hear me, I'm going to remove you from the screen and invite you back. You gotta love technology, huh? <laughs> oh, it's um, it's pretty m miraculous. It works as often as it does. I think. Yes. Um. All right, she should be back with us in just a moment. Her and I live around the same area. We're having some storms coming through. I'm wondering if. Just to fill the silence, I'm going to read Rob G's remark. Violet, your conversational metaphors rock. Can't wait to read your new book. I agree they do. And Rob G, you're really in for a treat. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's, it's, it's one of the, it's certainly one of the best three or four books I've read s so far this year. Um, so assured. I'm sorry, I have Violet on the phone. Her power went out. Oh no. <laughs> so oh no. Just a moment. <laughs> okay. Brian Lutz, while we're waiting, would you mind answering your own question, David? What influenced you at a young age? <clears throat> okay. Um uh Bearing in mind, this is, of course, um, uh, the, the the event is uh, for Violet's book. So as soon as she's back, I'll hop off again. But quickly, um, there was a British comic called 2000 AD. Uh, it was a science fiction comic. Uh, it serialized some American science fiction uh, writers, including Harry Harrison, um, author of a pretty great series called The Stainless Steel Rat. Uh, oh. She is connecting through her phone or tablet. She lost power. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so not only is she a great writer, she also uh, knows what to do when your router goes down in the middle of a thunderstorm. Indeed. 
at least I hope it was a thunderstorm and not a great giant a giant Vietnamese ghost snake made of smoke. One doesn't know. <laughs> One doesn't know. We'll find out soon. I can take this time to remind everyone that they can submit their questions for the authors by clicking the uh, area on the screen that says ask a question. You can type your question there. If you'd like to purchase books, you can click the button on your screen that says buy the books. Oh. Hop back to Brian's question. So we have the comic 2000 AD, um, Ursula Le Guin, her Earthsea books. I absolutely love those. I've reread them multiple times and they worked each and every time. And I do remember uh, closing the last one, which in those days was still the farthest shore, and, and just thinking, damn, I want to do that. I really want to do that to do to other people what she had just done to me. So I would certainly include her in in the group. And then these early, early-ish Spielberg films that um, conquered the UK as they did everywhere, everywhere, everywhere else. E.T., Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I think Close Encounters was my first utterly immersive cinematic experience um i've never been swallowed whole by a film until then i have been many times since but uh as with a kiss uh the first one's the one you remember uh even if later ones can be more spectacular and suddenly we're going down an avenue i didn't mean to go down but um yeah so i would i would nominate those three narratives as um as ones that um that put me on this path, if that's the right word, and made me want to do unto others what had been done unto me. Oh, thank you, Laura. Me too. Ursula Le Guin books were great. All caps. Oh, you too, Brian. It's not unusual. Um, many writers of my generation um, Neil Gaiman has a huge respect for her as well, I know. Um, her science fiction as well. She was a great genre demolisher. Uh, not genre, uh, highbrow, lowbrow demolisher. Uh, I think they're great artists. They don't care where they are on any cultural hierarchy. I can't believe for a moment that Shakespeare ever thought about this. Um, his question wasn't, do I pitch this high? Do I pitch this low? It, it, it's how do I make this good? And I think it's a consistent, um, because a, a consistent quality of, of all the greats. I'm going to talk about her as if she's not here. And since she isn't here, I don't have to embarrass her by reading a little bit of her work aloud. She's a great stylist. This is going to be one of my questions, and I hope will still be. Uh, just listen to this. Um, he returned to his bed. When he finally closed his eyes, the pattern of phosphenes that crackled across the blackness made his l lids... Um, I'm sorry, uh, the pattern of phosphenes that crackled across the blackness inside his lids took the form of thin, bright hairs, ghostly hairs made of light, hundreds upon hundreds of them, a 10,000 errand, sorry, I need my glasses, a 10,000 strand mebius strip wound round the interior of Jean-Pierre's skull, spinning endlessly, each one whispering a name that he could not hear. Ah, I just read this and I think, ah, I feel great to, um, to be in a world where books like this are and you can just help yourselves to them. It's available, by the way, if you just buy the book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but there's something this good on every page. This, it, it, it isn't that this is the best bit, it's just a best bit. She writes absolutely beautifully. Um, 
yeah, um, I'm kind of envious. <laughs> um, the care which he brings to the sentences, the musicality with which he effortlessly, seemingly effortlessly, we've heard it wasn't effortless, uh, but the musicality with which he endows them, uh, it's a real gift. Not many people have it. Now I think I've gone quiet. I can keep reading. You can get your glasses. We'll wait. <laughs> Thank you, love. I've only just needed them. Um, um, I've had 52 years of um, not needing glasses, and uh, it comes to us all. But, uh, I'm not complaining. Oh, you can still hear me. That's from Nick. Um, yes, it is. Uh, Nick points out that it's a funny book. Um, that's one of the joys. It is funny, but many other things as well. Um, and when a book combines these qualities, I think really unexpected things happen. I try to do that in my own work. Um, it's a quality of many of the things I admire. You put something next to each other, but I've got no idea if I'm speaking uh, to a blank screen here, so, but I'll carry on anyway just to kill the time. But I often find, well, I, I like to use a visual analogy. You have, a, you have green and you have orange, like a Howard Hodgkin painting. You've got a green strip and an orange strip, and you put them next to each other, and your eye kind of creates a thin black line between the two. Hey, thank you, Laurie. It's not actually there, but your eye does it. It's just because the, the colour green, when you put it next to the colour orange, they make a third thing. I think the same happens. I think this is a molecular deep principle of art. You put two things next to each other, you get a third thing. You put comedy next to something deeply menacing. Um, you have to do it right, otherwise it's a hodgepodge mishmash they negate each other. But if you do do it right, and of course, that's the kicker. How do you do it right? That's a different conversation. But if you do do it right, then you make this third thing and build your house around my body fizzes with this third thing. She's got hallucinogenic, trippy passages next to deeply observed passages on, on the anthropology of expats in Saigon. Um, Next to, um, next to a drug scene, next to a psychologically acute, heartbreaking sense of homesickness that isn't quite homesickness, it's something else. Four things from the top of my head there. Um, she combines them and these little black lines I was speaking about with the green and the orange, uh, they form this mesh. Uh, it's so clever. Um, when I'm when I'm in a more pretentious mood, I call this the principle of propinquity. Pro propinquity, of course, being the fancy Latin word for nextness to each other, uh, just things being adjacent. Uh, and once you and once you start looking out for this principle, it's actually everywhere. It's there in music as well. Anyway, um, Kathy just heard an update that I was asked to write here. Violet is on her way to the library to reconnect. Um, the library will save us all. Uh, thank you, Marin, Marin Takikawa. Uh, fine Japanese name, if I'm not mistaken. I would instantly buy a David Mitchell narrated audiobook of Violet's book. <laughs> Thank you. If the writing doesn't work out, then I will um, nominate my services as a side gig. E. Oppenheim. Sorry to lag so far behind the conversation. Just still on the way to. Sorry, just still on the way. Long gradually builds and builds a plausible narrative of Winnie's disappearance without ever fully believing it, only to fully terrify himself the moment he discovers a piece of, to him, truly corroborating evidence. That's true. Uh, it's psychologically really astute. These are real people. Um, and and, and, and the, ah, the entanglement between the brothers and Bin as well. Um, they love each other 
Bin comes in. They both love her. They resent the other. They're jealous of each other, and they love each other. Um, it's layers. I think perfectly okay, but only merely okay. Writing only has one space for a feeling. Um, you see this on these um, kind of two, three star Netflix shows that aren't actually bad, but you kind of want your time back again after spending uh, an evening watching a couple of episodes. The characters only have space for one emotion. They don't, um, and, and, and when that expires, then another one um, replaces it and the plot works through that. And when that expires, another one replaces it. Um, they are sequentially emotional. Um, the real thing, art, really great writing, it's not sequential, it's simultaneous. Um, all Violet's characters feel multiple things all at once, and they're all true, and they're all real, and they bubble and seethe, and sometimes some kind of temporarily win and control the actions, uh, what the characters say, what they do. but only temporarily and they recede and others take their place but they're all always there influencing the character um i think she does this effortlessly uh despite what she was saying about the book having a difficult birth um this aspect i just think it's a knack she has it's just something she can do um laura uh Lahaska Doylestown Book Club just finished reading your book, Slade House, where you illustrated worlds juxtaposed with one another. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you also because it raises another point. Ghost stories are short. They can only be short before they morph into something else. Um, a ghost is a liminal thing. It's either one thing or another. Um, It's the central part of a Venn diagram. What I sh should have said just now, after 60, 70 pages at most, a ghost story must become one thing or another, merely a story of the uncanny or the fantastical. Uh, how do you make it last? It isn't, it, 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 it isn't a genre that lends itself to longevity. Um, even perhaps the greatest, Henry James's The Turn of the Screw or... or um, um, the Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. Um, they're, they're only about 100 pages. Um, this, of course, is 376 or so. Um, and she does this with a structure. Um, it's, 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 it's the hopping about through time. It's great, in a sense, the opening chapter would be a lesser book's climax it's it's the disappearance uh and then i love the way the chapters um measure their point of being in reference to the disappearance literally every chapter begins 69 years before the uh, before the disappearance or three months before the disappearance or or, or or perhaps six hours after the disappearance haven't really seen this done before um and when we get violet back i I've been interviewed a few times, as you can imagine, and I try to pride myself as an interviewer by not asking questions that I've had too often as an interviewee. Uh, and I also find myself unable to do this frustratingly often. I just want to ask her, um, did you write the whole thing in sequential order, thinking that was your book, or did you write it that way, realize it wasn't your book, and then and, and, and then merely cut, edit, and rearrange, or, and I think, I mean, I'm, I'm impressed with the book anyway, but uh, I would be supernaturally impressed if the answer was no, she had this idea from the beginning that she was going to start with it, and then uh, that she was going to start with the disappearance, and then uh, hopped about through time. Um, anyway, we have Courtney. Uh, hi, I'm from the Random House publicity team. 
uh, Chrissy and Violet have both lost power due to the bad storms here on the East Coast and we're trying to log back on. Thank you for all your patience. Laura, we noticed horror stories have to be short. We read sci-fi, fantasy and horror. Yeah. Um, they can be long, but they need to morph into something else. Um, we've got mystery here. We've got crime, which do actually loan themselves, especially crime, to to longer forms. Um, crime, I think, I think of that as 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 tracing a path th through the labyrinth that you can't see from above. Obviously, you're in it, but. Um, but as you explore it, then the map becomes visible. Um, I hope you don't mind me rambling on like this, but I got addicted to this uh, video game. It's a great thing about having a teenager in the house. You start to learn about the world, the big sections of the world you just wouldn't have known uh, were you not blessed with a teenager. Red Dead Redemption 2, it's a game. Um, you're an outlaw in, in the American West in the 1890s, and you start off in the middle of this blank in this middle of a blank map. You don't know where anything is. It's just a big blank rectangle. The whole game area, the game world is terra incognito. And slowly as you go on journeys, you start to build up the map. And actually the map, when you go to the map to see where you are, becomes filled in with the place names and the topography of the world. I feel the same is true of Violet's book. You start off not knowing where anything is or what anything is. It's a, This is also um, the technique of the crime novel. Uh, you don't know what anything is, but as you walk through the path, the greater labyrinth becomes visible in the context of where you've been. That's how it works. So she combines that method with a ghost story. Uh, clever, clever, clever stuff. You've only got about 50, 60 pages out of a ghost story. But uh, by hybridizing them in this way, you can actually make a ghost story last. It's part crime, part ghost story. I love these improbable hybrids. Um, there's other layers here, just as I was saying about um, the characters having various motivations, various psychological levels all at once. Uh, the same is true of genre within the book. I don't know about you because I can't see or speak with you, whoever you are or how many of you there are. 70 people, thank you. Um, but I loved how... Uh, I, lo um, I, I loved the descriptions of the cooks, the, the, the expats, just the eye the, um, of, of, of the different tribes that live in Saigon, both the foreign tribes and the native tribes, the, the underworld characters, the, the nouveau riche characters. I love the English school and, uh, and, and I worked at a not altogether dissimilar place in Hiroshima for four years. So I certainly, she's got a great eye for the types. She, she portrays them really well. Um, and they're all there. They're all valid. Um, they make up so so it, uh, what i'm attempting to say is this is uh, another instance of the manyness of violet's writing uh, it's not this one or that one or that one it's all of them at once uh, which of course is reality this is life um it is a simultaneous prospect and the notion that it's a sequential one is merely the human mind trying to put order onto chaos um, Emmy, thanks for holding down the fort and singing while it's praises. They're very easy to sing, uh, and you're very welcome. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it would have been more tactful to have merely withdrawn rather than subject you to my rather structureless ramblings. Uh, Lucy and Molly, Violet is not being delayed by a Vietnamese snake. This delay is colonial rage. Whoa, Molly Friedrich. Violet's literary agent. Hey, Carrie. Hi. Uh, uh, I've been rambling like a madman. Um, it's, it's been great. I think I'm hearing an echo. Hold on. I'm just going to get rid of that. Okay. Is that better? Um, I can hear you fine. I could before. Could before. Oh, now I'm before. hearing. Uh, now I'm hearing an echo from. No, I'm not hearing an echo. No echo. We are an echoless zone. An echoless. Okay, excellent. Um, 
Violet is on, on her way um, to the library, I think, as Courtney mentioned. So she Life is, is we'll um, and, and I, I am um, stepping in for Chrissy since the store has also lost power. And I, I am, imagine, oh, Violet is here. Okay. And now I'm going to let her in. Let's see if I can do this. No pressure, Gary. No nope, pressure. I know. Gary. I know. <laughs> you in New York. Hey, <laughs> Violet. Oh, I feel the like the will save that. us all. Oh, I told them I'm I'm being noisy because I'm zooming with David Mitchell. Crowdcast. Sorry, it's fine. I Unless love who? That English comedian. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of peep show fame. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad that you're back. I will disappear now, so you guys can can resume your conversation, <laughs> and and then I, I will come back later. Yes. Oh boy. Unless, hey, Viola, like, glad you're back. Well, that's pretty dramatic. Thanks, thanks, thanks for not leaving. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, no, I'm with it. Um, um, I've been having a nice conversation with many of your fans via uh, the board here, and subjecting them to my um, uh, rather nebulous. Theories of art. So, um, so we've been having, sure this is um, the biggest treat. They will hope I lose power again. Not at all. <laughs> uh, you're back before I had to resort to my two standard emergency jokes, which were um, uh, a skeleton walks into a bar and says, I have a pint and a mop, please. <laughs> uh, as opposed to the termite who walks into the bar and says where is the bar tender wait i missed it bartender bar tender because he's a termite and it eats wood so it wants to know where is the I, bar get I get it i get it i get oh, um, it oh i can't believe i taught the english too <laughs> that took me too long <laughs> oh, not at all uh Welcome back. Lovely to have you back. Um, just in case the storm gets a live bit, I think I'm going to jump into um, the questions. Um, to my shame, I don't think I've read any much Vietnamese-centric fiction before, as opposed to history. Uh, what is your relationship to the Vietnamese culture? Um, your name is not immediately Vietnamese, so over to you. It is not immediately recognizable as Vietnamese and neither is my my person generally and so I, I usually in, in in America at least um, and so I, I I grew up sort of feeling kind of like I was peering in through through a window um, at, at like Vietnamese culture in general and or sort of like I was in the in the corner at best. Um, but most um, like stories about Vietnam that w when I started like, consuming adult literature, they were the things we carried. It was uh, war centric and soldier centric mm -hmm. and about GIs and prostitutes. Um, and I think it's only in the, the last few years really that it's the, um, the sort of the spectrum of, of Vietnamese and Vietnamese diasporic fic uh, fiction has really sort of expanded in um, ways that I find interesting, um, which has been lucky for me that I've been trying to sort of carve out my own little spot in it um, while while things are sort of growing organically. Um, but yeah, but um, I, I, I always was inspired by sort of folkloric Mm. Stories. And that's where that's why I feel like the roots are. Yeah. Um, um, j uh, j just at a purely um, autobiographical l level, um, how much time do you spend in Vietnam? Um, do you, uh, if, if if someone says, "What are you?" How do you answer? <laughs> I do get asked that a lot. Um, no, 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 no. I didn't know. It's, it's, it's much better coming from me than being yelled at me on the street, which, which happens. Oh, no. <laughs> it is okay. I feel like, oh, I'm an enigma. Interesting. Um, no, but um, 
uh, the first time I went back to Vietnam was with uh, my mother's family when I was 13. Yeah. Um, but uh, before that, growing up, um, I had visited m most of my, my Vietnamese family. My mother's family lives in Houston. Um, they were resettled in, in Port Arthur, Texas, after they came over following uh, the fall of Saigon in 1975. Um, but, but Houston has a, a huge Vietnamese population. Right. And it always felt kind of like go, going to this funny pocket of, of, of Vietnamese culture that exists sort of out of time. Yeah. Um, okay. So I would spend my summers there, but um, I went back for the first time when I was 13. And then I lived there on my own um, for the first time the summer before my senior year at college. And I, I was an intern at a publishing house in Hanoi. Whoa. Um, <laughs> and this is where I started um, writing the, the short story collection, my first yeah. book. Yeah. Um, and then um, after I graduated, I moved to the rural Mekong Delta to um, become a terrible English teacher. Not quite like Winnie level bad. <laughs> She's pretty bad. She's really pretty bad. <laughs> I was awful for, for other for other reasons. But. <laughs> uh, um, I um, I don't know how long you spent at it, but um, or, or how long you um, how many years you spent as an as, as as an English teacher. But had you stuck at it, I think you would have become a wonderful teacher of the English. Um, <laughs> I don't know about that. Everyone's pretty useless for the first two or three years. Um, you you you. you don't even know what you don't know, but um, then as the years go by, I think you can learn how to be of more use. You can, um, you'll never be one of the cooks, of course, but uh, in your novel. But, <laughs> but, uh, um, but uh, yeah, uh, there's a ladder of progression. Sure. Um, how's your spoken Vietnamese and your uh, literary Vietnamese? Can you read the language? Oh, my, I'm a terrible reader, worst reader. I, I was proficient once upon a time. Um, and I was sort of, um, so after after I finished uh, torturing my students um, as a teacher, I moved you to- You weren't that bad, I'm, <laughs> I'm not convinced at all. Um, I um, So I moved to a city called Dalat, where I was just, that I'm just going to live here, I am going to write a novel and I sort of, jumped into it as I do most things, which is um, without very much planning. <laughs> and so my, my Vietnamese was kind of like sink or swim Vietnamese. So I was very good at like food, uh, I don't, making small talk with people to ask them about ghosts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But my, my written um, Vietnamese comprehension is worse than Winnie's, I'm sure. I needed to in the novel. I needed to ha to have her be slightly more proficient than I am. When you were growing up, did you speak Vietnamese at home? No, my no. my dad's American and my mom's English is perfect. And so when we grew up in in Pennsylvania, so we were very sort of removed from the Vietnamese nexus. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, uh, congratulations on your language skills. <laughs> assembled that language by hand rather than imbibed it as a kid. I think that's quite an achievement. Well, I don't know if I would have been drawn to, to writing about Vietnam or felt the urge to go and live there after college if if I had grown up maybe more secure in my own Asianness. So yeah. I guess it I yeah. guess it worked out in a way. There's a uh, the, the the Japanese word as you may know for uh, a kid of two nationalities. They 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 take the English adjective half and Japanese it into a noun. So my kids, for example, be half who's in Japan. Uh, and this is a theme in your book. Uh, we have Jean-Francois, Jean um, um, and Winnie herself, of course. And I made a little list even. Um, there's a couple of others, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, uh, that's Alex's kid. Yes, his baby. <laughs> um, and obviously, I guess for personal reasons, but also for anthropological reasons, um, you said outside looking in, 
uh, and 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 there's the connotation that's there hiding in plain sight in the Japanese word. Um, is it a half or is it a both? Is it uh, is it actually a a full or bit minority? Um, is it a full identity in its own right? Do you think? Uh, is it uh, in Venn diagram terms? Where might you put it? Is it mm. a bit? Is it both circles? Um, um, well, in, this in, a question, but if you could take the baton of this conversation and run with it, I'd be grateful. Okay. Well, <laughs> I mean, that, that was sort of where I started the novel. That was my jumping off point. Like, what does it mean to, 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 to not feel like you belong anywhere instead of belonging in both places? Mm. Um, and in Vietnamese, the, the word, the literal translation I would use to describe myself was, was mixed. But yeah. I think like, like Winnie, I, I also felt like instead of being both, I was neither or other. Yeah. And um, sort of the more speculative elements of the book came from thinking about other kinds, other kinds of others, sort of other, other hybrids, yeah. um, or other mixed characters um, who sort of, they, they, they shed their skins and transform into something utterly different because they can't, their Venn diagrams don't connect. It feels like yeah. two separate right. circles. Yeah. That's a good answer. Um, uh, there's um, one of Long's rather ne'er-do-well drinking buddies asks Winnie at one point, which half is your American half? That sounds not made up. That sounds like something you heard once. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think oh, and that you detected that. That is something that was asked to me couple times as like uh, an, an old uh, joke that yeah that people like to to do i don't know and it stuck with me and i, I think that would happen it would on the other hand you have the writer's revenge of being able to use it, and put it in your novel so uh who has a last laugh uh violet has a last laugh <laughs> maybe i don't think i don't think that those people will will ever read this book <laughs> Uh, probably not. But it still counts as a quiet victory uh, for me, anyway. Um, ooh, ever seen a ghost? Yes. Yes. Um, I'll give you your ghost story. Um, so if you give me your ghost story, I'll give. You, this is almost a title of your novel. So you first. <laughs> um, well, it's more heard a ghost. Mm -hmm. So when I when I moved to Dalat, city of ghosts and former French colonialism, um, I was I, I sort of appointed myself. I am I am now a, a, a paranormal investigator. <laughs> I'm researching. Oh this wow! Um, you were the fortune teller. He <laughs> was a little bit. Mm. Um, uh, so and Dalat is famous for these uh, these old ruins of French villas. Um, that have since been knocked down since I left Vietnam, but that have ghost lore surrounding them. Mm. And I thought it was a very good idea to try and spend the night in one of them. Okay. For part of my ghostly research, <laughs> which it was it was a terrible idea, but um, 25 year old Violet thought it was fine. Um, so <laughs> I went with a couple of friends to try and to try and sleep in the famous ghost house. Um, and then the longer I was there, the, the more I realized this was a terrible idea because even if we, even if we don't see a ghost, there are like, these, the houses are out in like a pine forest. And I thought, oh, we could get, we could just get killed. Um, and so I was, I was lying there sort of trying to go to sleep at three in the morning. And I heard these footsteps, two foot, two pairs of footsteps coming up this long gravel path that led underneath sort of the open carcass of this old ruined house. And I heard these footsteps approach and I was, I said, oh no, motorbike thieves. That's what these are. Cause I, okay. and I heard them, sort of these two voices talking underneath, underneath the house in the front. So when I woke up my friends and had them sort of run downstairs to ambush them, another terrible idea. <laughs> and then no one was there. 
but it wasn't something where where if it was a corporeal being, it could have escaped without any sound. Yeah. yeah. It just vanished. That's pretty good. Uh, I was I was certainly getting the beginning of goosebumps there. Um, it also puts you in a subset of people who see ghosts, i.e. people who are actively looking for ghosts. Uh, normally, um, it's it's when you're not doing that. It, it, it's 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 as un, unusual as someone who goes out UFO hunting and actually sees one when they're UFO hunting. So that sort of gives your um, gives your story a meta specialness, I think. Um, mine reminded me of um, Long's experience at the end when oh, uh, no spoilers. Uh, so I'll just skip what I was. It was, I was living in this house at the edge of Hiroshima. I'd just moved in, uh, an old house by a river where many of the burn victims walked up, essentially before they died uh, in 1945 uh, after the bomb. And um, it's a haunted zone. Uh, I was in this house right by the river, and I woke up one night, and there was someone standing at the end of my bed. It was pitch black, the uh, screens were closed, the door was locked, but I simply knew there was something standing at the, at the end of my bed and I couldn't move and I couldn't shout, I couldn't do anything. I just, I was, I was just there. Uh, there's even um, a word for this in Japanese when I told my um, then girlfriend, now wife, it's, Kanashibali. It's kind of a thing when 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 you're bound by a ghostly presence, mm -hmm. and the ghost wanted to know what I was doing in in his house, uh, and I was then allowed to speak, just to answer. And so, in in in, in, in my faltering Japanese, all I could do was just explain that I'm temporary here. Um, I, I'm just renting the place for a year or so, if that would be okay, and then I'll be gone and all in place with respect and that's about all I could say and then this presence just slowly receded and then it was gone and then there was nothing to do I mean I didn't jump up and run around and look for evidence that just felt needless I just felt that I had permission to be there and I went back to sleep and I never felt that again um and you stayed that. there you yeah. didn't run. well <laughs> I'd sort of applied for permission and had somehow passed that very basic interview. That, yeah, okay. You can stay there. <laughs> it wasn't approval, but it was. It was just like, "What are you doing in my house? Who are you exactly?" It was just. It was like that. Um, and well, anyway, uh, this is about you rather than me. No, but, um, I think I think one that's very creepy. Two, very impressive that in the midst of ghost paralysis you were able to speak in Japanese but three also sort of fascinating from the because I might I might if I was writing it I might think like is there like a ghost auto translate but the language that I think it's interesting that it does make sense that it would speak in Japanese instead of um, just sort of being in this the its question being internalized by you I may have inadvertently made myself seem more impressive than, than 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 I actually was. It wasn't thinking, yes, I'll speak Japanese. It was simply <laughs> like I had to kind of. It wasn't going to understand English. It didn't occur to me that it might. Uh, it was. Um, I was the guest. I was the, the the tenant in his house, and it was incumbent upon me to speak to, to speak his language. Um, so I, I had no choice. I I, I I would have done it in English. In the same way, I didn't really have the option of being too petrified to speak. I wasn't cool, calm and collected. I was just very, very clear that this was the situation and this was how I was expected to respond. And there wasn't a menu of alternatives. It was this and nothing else. So so I just did what I had to do. Um, and I was okay after it. Anyway, this was slightly in the back of my mind when I was reading your rather more disturbing uh, encounters with the supernatural um, Ms. Cooper's thing. Anyway, um, back to one or two 
questions. Uh, you are an exquisite stylist. Uh, I hope you don't mind, but I read a little bit out for the uh, audience when you were uh, on your way oh, to the no. library. Could I ask oh, what part is it? <laughs> sure. Um, it was. Uh, I also revealed that I need. I need to put glasses on. Um, Not to test you, but I was just curious. <laughs> could have been any part. Uh, oh, no. You really do this all over the place, but we returned to his bed. Uh, uh, this is the two French guys six, nine years ago. And he finally closed his eyes. The pattern of phosphines, I had no idea they were called, the pattern of phosphines that traffic across the blackness inside his lids took the form of thin white hairs, ghostly hairs made of light, hundreds upon, in the page, hundreds of them. A 10,000 strand Mobius book wound around the interior of Jean Pierre's skull. Uh, Jean Pierre, not Jean Pierre. No, no uh, this is Jean Pierre, isn't it? Sorry, Jean Pierre. Uh, a 10,000 strand Mobius book wound around the interior of Jean Pierre's skull, spinning endlessly, each one whispering the name that he could not hear. Oh. Just gorgeous. I As, feel sort of guilty for how much fun I had writing about the, the, the Frenchman. Am, am I a betrayer of my race? I don't know. Really, I, really I couldn't possibly about the <laughs> uh, I couldn't possibly comment, but um, um, just stylistically, you know, um, you you may well agree or not necessarily, but um, any act of creation, any book, novel, it's a series of decisions, big, huge, macro ones. Who's this about? What's it about? Where am I going to set it? When am I going to set it? What's the structure? And then tiny little micro decisions. Do I use the word maybe here or do you use the word perhaps here? Uh, many you notice yourself making because you have to think of them. You have to define the problem, medium size up to macro. But actually micro decisions, it's merely, I, um, I think often you don't really consciously or that consciously weigh up the options. You just sort of the marble of you rolls of, down the groove that feels as if the groove is sort of chiseled. Uh, but of course, it must be you who's doing the chiseling. It's, it's, it's well, your relationship with style that's doing chiseling. The relationship is pre-existing. That's why you don't consider that long and hard. Um, the individual words that you use to compose this short passage here, I just read out, style. Um, I'm really interested in it. Um, it's distinctive. Yours is. Everyone's is, uh, except people who are consciously imitating someone else's style. I think it's as unique as your iris pattern, as your fingerprints. Um, hard to turn this into a question, really, because you merely have it uh, and you've acquired it. But where it can turn into a question is um, are there stylists you admire? Not necessarily say the structure they use or the plot they come up with but this at the kind of molecular structure of a sentence you think oh wow what a gorgeous sentence how did you do that is there anyone that makes you think that always um angela carter for me what? in the form of sort of the the, the juiciness of, of the word she picks and she yeah. like so, sometimes just the it's, it's a word you would have never thought of, but it's it's perfect, and it is sort of I don't know. It, it's very related to, to to food to me. I'm like this is this yeah. is a delicious sentence, a delicious yeah, Carter yeah. sentence. Yeah. Um, oh, I love her and um, the author Helen Oyeyemi. I think I think her her sentences are just things of beauty, and I wish it could be sort of transmogrified into like a canvas. So I don't know what it would look like, but if it, if a sentence could look like something, or the way I feel I feel when I read it could be put on something and then slapped on my wall for me to enjoy, I wish it could happen. I know exactly what you mean. I wish I could eat them. Yes. <laughs> what would it? Um, your sentences. So I'm I'm moving up one level from style to sort of clause level. Your sentences have really oddly angled hinges that bend and swing in odd directions. You might have three or four of them separated by uh, prepositions. Um, and it means that when you start off one of your 
sentences, you have no idea where it will lead. That's pretty unusual. Most sentences, they're, uh, they're like um, hope songs, where you hear the first phrase, you know, the second phrase is going to be repeated the first. The third phrase will do something weird and different and ask a question. The fourth phrase will loop back to the first and answer the question. That's sort of a folk trope. Uh, there's literary equivalent. Most people's sentences, well, most two-part sentences, uh, first clause, a but, then it's going to go some down, or it will refute part one, or you've got uh, first clause and an and, and then, you know, the second part is going to be um, a reinforcer of the first part. Your sentences, Violet, um, the prepositions can do really odd things, which means that when you read the first clause, um, say it's a four clause sentence and you're not afraid of the long sentence, um, you never know where the fourth one is going to take you. It's so clever because it means you never switch off. You pay attention, A, because you want to, because the writing is so succulent, uh, stylistically, and B, because you have to. You have to pay attention. Um, so that's a two for one. Um, again, hard to turn this into a question. Um, this is just a compliment. <laughs> it is. Um, but I'll sort of, I, get, I do love to do this. And is there, um, sorry, just to put in, but um, yeah. I'm slightly wondering if it's a, if it, if it's quality of bilinguality. Um, your Japanese is, uh, sorry, um, well, your Vietnamese is, uh, your Japanese is here. really, <laughs> it's, it's, it's upper intermediate, lower advanced than what I can ascertain. And I'm just wondering if, um, if quality of mixed or both or half linguistic heritage is that oh, it no. can do oh, no. three things to oh, your oh, oh, no. Yeah. Uh, oh, no. I could... I can hear you, but I can't see you. Hello. Hello, Violet. Did I freeze? There's a question. Oops. You can hear me. Oh, that's embarrassing. And I'm just going to go with it. I'm okay. sorry. I'll talk to Frozen David. Um, um, I do I, love like a sentence that's like, an octopus and um, goes in unexpected ways and has long tentacles and creeps around. Um, I don't think I really do. Uh, I don't think I really, I really plan it. I do sort of go careening around um, as, as a, as a sentence driver. Um, yeah. And I, I hope that I make the, the sentences a, a delicious experience for the reader because I think the novel it asks a lot of you, um, and so I'm kind of I, I want I want you to to enjoy the ride because I'm I'm <laughs> I'm I'm demanding a lot of you and a lot of things to keep track of and so like I want I want to make the ride exciting I want to keep you on your toes and I want the sentences to sort of be unpredictable or to to try and um, imitate in my syntax what I hope the, the reading experience will be for you. That's a great answer, uh, which involves, um, a five, involves a five I star. Don't, I don't know. I'm not as, as good um, if I'm the one who's unfrozen. I'd rather be the frozen one. Uh, <laughs> what should I do now? Um, we've got a frozen picture. Luckily, it's caught in a pretty complimentary position, um, rather than when your face is in the middle of... Uh, oh, yeah, you're back. Hey! Um, can you hear me, Violet? Hey, Violet, can you hear us? I think I can hear some background noise uh, in a library where you are, but I can't hear Violet. No. 
can hear me. I can hear you now. Can you hear me, Vina? Okay, you can hear me. I can hear you now. Can you hear me? But I feel like I'm in the void. Why don't I tell David to ask a question? Yep. Okay. And you all write it out. Oh, no. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, um, that would be a, a question from another question. And we're sort of doing a live interpretation of of how my Vietnamese works. It needs to be translated. Can I read? I can read the tab. Should I pop in and out again? Should I try to, 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 to go in and out? Yes, have a go at that. We'll answer on oh, behalf of those. Um, I can see you. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Folks, if you can still hear me, could someone say, uh, yes, I can hear you. Oh, am I back? You're back. <laughs> oh, no. Was I, fro I was hey. frozen in a really weird, was I frozen in a very weird stance? Uh, no, I would lie to you if you were. But okay. You were, uh, but you weren't. You were frozen in a really good stance. So oh, no. It was very unfair to me because you were frozen to me, sort of in, like, it looked like author portrait. I don't know. It could have been. I've gone better. <laughs> oh, uh, no. You look pretty as well. Uh, no need to worry there. Um, I'm going to. Uh, this is a. This is an odd but very memorable event. I think. I've I never hope had, so. Well, I can't speak for the 73 people, but actually we're growing, so we should maybe do this as a deliberate strategy. Uh, Probably. Just, uh, uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for sticking with us. Um, I'm. I'm pretty grateful. Uh, and I'm kind of enjoying myself and in a weird way absorbing your energy from the chat box. So thank you. Um, I'm almost at the end of the questions here, but um, um, I do like to ask this of authors as well. I used to play Dungeons and Dragons a lot as a kid, uh, this role playing game, which which might date me. Um, but um, you pretend to be a, a, a thief or a wizard or a fighter or something, and you go about a kind of a mind world having adventures. The interesting characters had two professions. Um, I was always interested in ones that could be both. They could be, say, both a fighter and a wizard. Uh, if, you, if you choose that option, you wouldn't be a great fighter and you'd be a great wizard, but, but you can kind of do a little bit of both. Um, sometimes I think novelists are two things as well. Uh, obviously, if they had a different... Um, profession before they were a novelist or, or, or a writer then 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 it's quite easy to identify so Chekhov was a doctor and his medical knowledge informed his writing I think uh, he, he would look at human beings as patients that he would diagnose uh, the bodies and hearts and souls of uh, Primo Levi, the Italian writer, was a chemist, uh, and that it was the, 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 the what is this made of? Kind of impulse. Uh, his writing is shot through with that. Ursula Le Guin, who I've mentioned, grew up as the daughter of uh, an anthropologist, and 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 there's all this sort of she she, she creates worlds as if she's an anthropologist we're just visiting them rather than I feel uh, um, a dreamer dreaming them up and doesn't know them very well. She knows them as an anthropologist. No. So my question for you, um, uh, what's your other 
you're an accomplished novelist with your one novel, you're already accomplished, just take my word for it. Uh, what's the other thing that, or are you able to identify another thing that you are that, 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 that informs this other half as a novelist? If that question makes any kind of sense. Over. It does, and I, I don't I don't think I'm half teacher. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I'm sort of it's sort of hard to identify because I I I I think I I wanted to only be a writer, and yeah. it was sort of my first career path, which is odd, and it I is. just kind of went into it. Um, and I was de determined to, to become a writer while I was being one, and I without really knowing what that entailed. Um, and I think I don't know before before that I was just like a a, a flaneur. I don't I don't know. I feel like mm. I was just <laughs> I was just <laughs> like a, a river swimming violet running around the Mekong Delta. Like I don't know, fishing for eels, and just I, I feel like I was a, like a child, <laughs> like a sneaky child, in addition to being a writer, and just trying, just using, approaching writing as if I was approaching the playground, in a way. That's an interesting answer, a good one. Um, I wonder if my theory could be uh, a half baked one, and it simply isn't true that writers are one thing plus another thing. Or it might also be true that you don't know what it is yet, and I like uh, that option. It will, it will emerge at the time. I just wanted to ask you briefly about libraries. Your dad's a librarian. Um, I think you said before we started. You're speaking from a library now. Um, I am this weird. Can you hear sort of a, a terrifying growling sound in your headphones? Can, but given oh. your novel, uh, I, I, I'm never that <laughs> Is surprised. Is that the ghost? Is that the ghost <laughs> finally coming? Have you got an organising impulse? Uh, do you like to things on the shelves they belong, or is this um, amateur pop psychology? Mm. Winnie certainly. <laughs> no, I'm I'm definitely more Winnie, and my hoarding ten tendencies. Um, I love I love a. A, a disgusting stack of, of, of partially read books in an order that makes sense only to me. Um. Okay, okay. Not the librarian then. Nice try, but uh, um, uh, we can leave it there. Um, your kind of, your other self may well emerge as the years pass and, uh, and drop me an email when you work out what it is because I'm doing it. <laughs> um, um, I've got a comment from Jamie, Jamie Fox. Uh, when you were uh, on your way to the library, I was talking about structure and just how much I enjoyed um, the unobvious nature of having the character disappear in the very first few <laughs> pages. And then every other scene, every other passage in the novel exists in relative distance to that. So if you start the chapters, 69 years before the disappearance, three months before the disappearance, two days after the, uh, after the disappearance. Um, um, I'm trying to ask this in a way that I don't get asked, but now I realize actually there's only one, there's only one way to ask this. Uh, did you plan this in the beginning or did you write the whole novel in chronological order, realize that everything was fine, but the structure wasn't? And then chop it up and put the end, or put, put a scene which would have been near the end at the beginning. Mm. Well, the, sh the short answer is I did not plan it, and the 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 story architecture was not in place from the beginning of the writing. Uh, but so I I wrote Winnie's storyline backwards, but the most of the other ones I wrote sort of forward in time, um, and then I didn't do. I didn't do a lot of, I did do splicing. And I, I originally was trying to, to bend the novel's form to fit, I don't. I had this, what I thought was a brilliant idea, which was a terrible idea. I, was, I will order it by wet season and dry season. <laughs> it'll, be a, it'll be like a, a farmer's almanac of a, of a something. And then I, I was trying to make it into a, 
like a, a zodiac. I don't, I don't, <laughs> which is it's embarrassing to tell you because mm-hmm. you're like the structure king, and I don't know. Yeah. They seem to have like a cosmic structure, and mine was sort of throwing things at the novel wall and seeing if a useful pattern could emerge. It works really well. It, it, I, I was, I, I was, I was reading it just speaking to my wife about it just saying god this is so good it's i i i i love the jumping about in time um i love the uh, that keeps the reader really alert it's 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 actually a reason um if i was i also read um the first half on a trip to the uk last week which is the first time uh, i've been abroad for ages and, and 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 that involves waiting around being bored i tend to veg out not really read that successfully when i'm when i'm i'm traveling but the reason i kept reading your book i wanted to see not only what happened next but when it happened uh there was a little sort of um a little m M&M to nibble on at the beginning of every chapter when this is happening in 16 69 years ago what how are you going to pull that off <laughs> and then or, or ee, we got after the disappearance. This is going to be great. Um, it's so clever. Um, I, um, it, it, it seems this was an unintended consequence. But um, I wonder if you agree that structure is a really underrated component of the novel. Uh, I think they have made of we got plot that sort of the football centre forward that gets all the glory. Uh, we got character that the winger of the plot uh, we've got the themes and ideas that's kind of midfield it's kind of, there. It kind of it, it's it, it uh you've got style which we've discussed already i i, I tend to think that's in defense but structure is something else um goalkeeper <laughs> manager, manager. yeah um thank you for uh thank you for your compliment about my structures but only once once or twice did I have the structure at the beginning. Normally I have to go wrong first. And I go wrong because the structure's not right. Uh, and I write 30, 40,000 words of perfectly good stuff, but it just, it's structured wrong and a lot of it doesn't actually belong in the novel. Um, and I thought it was the edifice of my glorious high-rise building, but it turns out just to be the scaffolding that I need to build the real this. Mm. It's just leading to a question, did you go wrong? If so, how did you go wrong? And why was how you went wrong instrumental to uh, going right? Because I have a hunch it was. I also realise I've, um, I've gone way over our a lot 15 minutes here, but if anyone needs to go back, pay the babies to do anything, leave without any <laughs> embarrassment, but um, but you're also equally welcome to stay, even as this reverts to uh, to me picking this wonderful writer's brains for tips and clues. Over to you. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I, I mean, I went wrong in every way, and I, I do. Ha- I want to give credit to my brilliant editor, Caitlin, who was the one who said, "Why don't you do it with chronologically with the disappearance?" Really. Um, and I do think that that decision. I felt, I, I I think I felt a lot more like like a badass when I was doing it because now like, yeah. the sixty nine year jump I felt I felt so much better about. It. I'm like this is, I I mean I'm gonna oh reader get ready. I it just <laughs> added this. I, I hope I hope they like the jumping keeps them on their toes but doesn't exasperate them. Not, <laughs> at, all. Not at all. Not at all. Oh yeah, but then that just that unlocked two different chapters that I hadn't written before the the structure was locked into place. And it was actually what I I came up with the ending, the actual ending of the book last. And that is, I think it was, I wasn't anticipating on writing the last part of the book last, but it worked out. And I think it wouldn't have done it without, without feeling sort of free to go three years after the disappearance. I said, um, I wasn't expecting the ending, uh, and it felt completely right, which is a satisfying ending. Uh, the fates of the characters vary widely, do they not? Uh, kind of 
Game of Thrones widely. I mean, this, this, mm. uh, the ones who do not end happily really do not end remotely happily. But um, but but the ones who do find a kind of um, again, um, I don't want to give any spoilers away, but uh, a major character who I thought would come to a sticky end, especially as Bin moves in, um, moves closer and closer. Um, kind of ends up finding a place in the world which I realised afterwards I wasn't waiting for, I wasn't anticipating, but I'm really glad you did. You know who I mean, don't you? I think so. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm I'm happy to I that that ending was planned from the beginning and right. I thought that's how the book would end. Yeah. Um, but but it didn't it didn't feel right in my in my writer's stomach, and, uh, and so and that's when the the new ending kind of. Um, you mentioned in. Roldal at the beginning. Uh, we'll come to you in in a minute, Carrie. I apologize. Yeah. Um, Go ahead, ignore me. I just want to speak this one in. Um, you know, Roldal's The Witches, where a character ends up as a mouse and there's no yes. way back. Absolutely. It's one of the scariest things I've ever read, actually ever, not, let alone in a kid's book. Um, there's, a, there's not a similar fate, but it's not that bleak because, um, uh, I apologize, uh, there's, there's, there's in, 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 in the universe, I, I mean, I'm apologizing to people who haven't read it yet, but I can't kind of get to this point without pointing out or without mentioning, uh, in the cosmology of Violet's book, uh, it is possible for essentially your soul to change bodies. Um, I don't think that's giving too much away. And one ends up in a vat. But instead of being sentenced there uh, forever, as the old dull mouse kid is, uh, it's a temporary stepping stone to bigger and better things. Um, and I don't know, that's just an, an, an observation about the witches. And I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if that. Well, I'm I'm sort of curious now how much how much of that was just sort of like a, like murking around inside the 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 little rice patty inside my brain and it got transformed into into the book in this way and it slithered in without me knowing that it was sort of a reference. Do you want people ask you? Did you mean something? Something? something that kind of question they ask you uh, events um, and then, and. The answer is no, you didn't, but it's still a really astute observation. I love it when that happens um, because um, it's a guide to the rice paddy in your mind. It's not, it's not, there's this middle zone. It's not a binary question. Um, and, and, and when it's a really it's not astute, a very binary book either. <laughs> it's it's not, about the uh, middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, Amen and Alleluia to the rice paddy in your mind, Violet. Um, I, um, I'm kind of winding up here, Carrie, so feel free to jump back in. <laughs> um, oh, um, I can't wait to see what other productions come from that rice paddy. Um, have you got a new novel in the way? Uh, I promise I won't tell Caitlin if you have. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, <laughs> I told yeah. her about the, the dreadful little seeds that are sprouting. I don't, I, I don't know what's going to happen with that. I always the body swerve uh, that question in, in exactly the same way, and it was ungallant of me to spring it on you right at the end. But uh, thank you for this event. I, I've, I've, I've enjoyed it enormously. Uh, thanks for all the support from the um, chat room folks who were. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you, actually. Literally, thank you yeah. for this uh, uniquely <laughs> participative event. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, David. Thank you, Violet. Um, heroic efforts both to make this happen. Um, and um, the Doylestown books, Bookshop is, is unfortunately still without power. Um, oh, yeah, hopefully, yeah. power right. will come back. But um, uh, they have many copies of Build Your House Around My Body for sale. So please buy one from them. Um, and um, just thank you both for this. This is what a, what a fantastic conversation and um, we will have a recording. So, so, um, <laughs> so <laughs> <miss them. laughs> Classic, it'll go viral. <laughs> thank you for greatness. <laughs> oh, thanks everyone. Thank you. It's really I can't thank you enough.
this uh, haunted book talk. I've had a great time. Um, and let's do it again sometime, yeah? Good night, everyone.